Hello, welcome to Baltic World, premier channel discussing news and important issues facing Northern, Central and Eastern Europe. My name is Chris Burton and I have a fascinating story for you today out of Poland. Poland is going to expand its armed forces to be the largest in Europe outside of Russia and Turkey. Now, the article I'll read out to you focuses on the financial aspects, but there are multiple layers to this. So, there is the direct security implications, such as Poland's concerns about Belarus and, and Russia, but also the increasing rift between Poland and the rest of the European Union. And I feel this is directly relevant. So I'll read out this article in its entirety, and then we will peel back that onion together. So this is from Reuters. It's titled, Poland to Upgrade Army Using Funding Methods First Deployed to Fight COVID. It says... Poland will use a mode of financing employed to fight the economic consequences of COVID-19 to help fund a large increase in military spending as the government seeks to modernize and expand the armed forces. Poland's government has used bonds issued by institutions such as the National Development Bank, BGK, or State Fund, PFR, but secured by the state to finance much of its spending on helping the economy through the pandemic. This has helped it avoid uh, including such spending in the state budget, a tactic that has been criticised by the Supreme Audit Office as it lacks transparency. Defence Minister Marius Blazek, now, I am terrible at Lithuanian names, except in comparison to Polish names, which is even worse, so I apologise for that. Uh, Marius Blazek said the government would create an armed forces support fund financed by government secured bonds issued by BJK Treasury bonds, the state budget, and profits from the central bank. Quote, this is a solution that was used by the COVID fund. I want to strongly underline that the Armed Forces Support Fund will be run by BGK, so it won't be some additional institution, Blazek told a news conference. He did not say exactly how much the expansion and modernization of the armed forces would cost. However, the leader of Poland's ruling Law and Justice Party, Jarosław Kaczynski, said spending would be, quote, significantly higher than 2% of gross domestic product, uh, the level required of NATO states, which Poland already exceeds. Now, this is quite interesting because very few European countries meet that target. The Baltic states do, Poland does, but Germany is an embarrassment, like 1.2%. Uh, France is below it, others are below it. So the fact that Poland has already reached that threshold and is expanding dramatically beyond it is quite significant, particularly with debt financing, which is rare in peacetime. Uh, anyway, quote, it is better to be safe than and a little more in debt, Kaczynski said. Blazek said the Defence Ministry aimed to have more than 250,000 full-time soldiers and more than 50,000 members of the Territorial Defence Force, which is made up of professional and part-time volunteer soldiers. In 2020, there are around 110,000 full-time soldiers, so more than double the current deployment of troops. And that is, you know, a wild increase in military size. And we'll leave it there. Of course, Belarus is engaged in a high-level hybrid campaign against the European Union along the Lithuanian border. Uh, Lukashenko is complaining that uh, others are looking for legitimate dialogue with the opposition, opposition which are uh, harbored by the Lithuanians in Vilnius. And so there is a government in exile which the EU is dealing with and Russia throwing its weight behind Belarus and, of course, a perennial threat to eastern NATO. Poland, like the rest of the world, is concerned that with the rise of China and the laser-like focus Washington must have to meet that peer competitive challenge that in a future contingency involving, say, China invading Taiwan, America will be absolutely absorbed in East Asia, will have no uh, time or resources to support Eastern Europe. It will really be up to the Europeans themselves to protect uh, the Baltic countries and, and make sure that Russia doesn't opportunistically move in to seize that territory. So Poland's military expansion is a significant boon for that outcome. It means that it is much, much harder for Russia to be able to peel bits off the Baltic countries to move into Poland and other places without a stern military response. And uh, one is increasingly unlikely to depend on the Germans and others uh, to fulfill that role. The Poles, who have a strong memory of the Soviet occupation, as do the Baltic countries, is the best placed nation 
to be able to provide that supporting role and be a legitimate partner for the United States and for the United Kingdom as well. So in terms of military expansion, this of course will be deeply welcome by the United States, by other allies, including Australia uh, in the Pacific, who realize that America is overstretched and has multiple military objectives it has to meet, make sure that China doesn't uh, succeed in taking over Taiwan, of course, deal with the Baltic countries and protect the territorial sovereignty. You've got Iran on the nuclear breakout threshold at the moment as well and all the implications that has for the state of Israel. So it really does uh, rely on the wealthier European countries, which Poland is not. I mean, compared to you know Germany and France, it still only has about six thousand US dollars per head of population GDP. Uh, still, it is well placed to step up and be a, a reliable American ally. So, from a purely military strategic point of view, deeply welcome move. Something that I'm sure the United States and Washington appreciates and supports. But there is a deeper issue here as well. Most of you would be aware, some of you won't, that the Polish government has been locked in a bitter dispute with the European Union. The Polish government has uh, created a judicial board uh, that allows oversight for the appointment of judges and potentially can fire them as well. The EU sees this as a grave threat to judicial independence, that it should be independent of government, and that this is something that uh, EU treaties require by law. So the EU took Poland to court in the ICJ, which ruled in favor of the EU and said, look, you must disband this body, and is fining the Polish government one million US dollars per day so long as this body remains. Now, the Polish government has said that laws that are incompatible with the Polish constitution, the national government takes precedence. This does not uh, EU law should not override national law in that instance. And people like von der Leyen in the EU are saying, no, that is absolutely false. You agree to judicial independence when you sign up to the EU. That's what the treaties say. And if we give this allowance for you in Poland, it means we have to give this allowance for everyone. And then the whole uh, system of law that we all agree to comes apart at the seams. Now, this is just one of multiple issues Poland has. Uh, another, of course, is the LGBT um, kind of rules that Poland has put in place. Poland is a staunchly Catholic country. Catholicism has a big social role, as it does in uh, Baltic, some of the Baltic countries, but has put them in stark opposition with uh, the Nordic countries that are absolutely liberal on these issues, some of the Western EU countries as well. And they look at uh, Poland and Hungary, which also has introduced these rules, as a kind of an outlier, as sort of a out going against the grain of the values of the European Union, of the pan-European identity, if you like. Uh, and there are some countries, such as the Baltic countries, that have had these rules on the books for a very long time. So it's been it's been on the books, but out of mind because it's not being debated presently in the relevant parliaments. So there is a uh, kind of an ethics gap, a values gap between the sort of pre uh, post Soviet countries that had been occupied uh, and those that were the traditional original uh, Western European uh, allies that had no experience of this. And there are deep social divisions that are unresolved. Uh, they do not see things eye to eye. And then there is this sense of nationalism that a lot of these countries in Eastern Europe still have strong feelings about. I remember back in 2008 now, Christian Zimmerman was, uh, he's a pianist, a famous Polish pianist. Uh, he was playing at Carnegie Hall and he stopped his performance, turned to the audience and lambasted them because the Americans were putting in uh, ballistic missile defense systems in Poland. He's like, keep your hands off my country. We don't want foreign military bases there. Now, of course, that went down like a lead balloon with his audience. But the reason he did that, the kind of motivating emotion, is he had just finished his piece playing Chopin and he was uh, feeling very deep sort of national pride and he passionately felt about the national territorial integrity of Poland, one that has previously been deeply vexed. Of course, most famously, it kicked off the Second World War with the agreement uh, between 
Germany and the Soviet Union to divide up that country. So the sense of territorial integrity of national borders of national identity is much stronger in countries like Poland and in the Baltic countries who have had the experience of foreign oppression and occupation during the Soviet years uh, than does the Western European countries that tend to take these things for granted, aren't really worried about you know, foreign threats that none of them worry that Russia is going to come over the horizon and invade their territory. And as a consequence, uh, uh, much more pan-European in their value system. And this is one of the things that kind of led to Brexit as well. Uh, this sort of pan-European super state that the EU is seeking to become. Well, the people of uh, Great Britain rebelled against that. They didn't want their laws to be dictated overseas in Brussels. They wanted them to be determined locally. And that across the whole range of, of areas, immigration, border control, uh, foreign labor, and, and, and foreign policy, you know, international relations, alliances, and the like. And so Britain has now stepped out of the European Union and is seeking to take on a more global role. Of course, there is the AUKUS arrangements with Australia and the United States. <clears throat> They're reinvigorating the Anglosphere, so-called. And uh, it looks like the European, Central European, Eastern European countries are doing likewise. And also, there are the the Eastern European countries, post-Soviet, you know, occupied countries, have generally speaking been much closer to the United States in foreign policy than France and Germany. If you think about the accession to the EU in the first place in two thousand and four, well, much of this was a reward from Washington uh, for the support in the Iraq war. The the Germans and the French were implacably opposed to that conflict, and yet the support the Baltic countries and Poland gave to the United States at that time was rewarded with NATO membership. It was rewarded with EU membership. It was very much your with us or against us kind of mentality, and the Americans have since supported it. Now, the, the if you look at the regional security kind of arrangements that are beginning to emerge uh, with Germany's kind of lackluster defense spending, which I mentioned earlier, they're becoming increasingly irrelevant for the United States. Uh, America does need to look elsewhere um, and is relying on new partners, in this case the Poles, to step up and fill very big shoes. Uh, the best contribution that the United Kingdom can make to uh, Asia Pacific security is to help support the Baltic countries and sort of shore up that, that uh, back flank probably alongside the poll. So with the UK outside of the European Union, there is a greater uh, flexibility for the UK to have bilateral security arrangements with Poland, with the Baltic countries. And we saw, as you would have seen in a previous video, Luce Trust, the foreign secretary, host the foreign ministers of the Baltic countries to talk about exactly this kind of subject. So there are f changing strategic alliances. And then if we go back to the relationship between the Polish government and the European Union, unlike Britain, the vast majority of Poles support EU membership. There is no real appetite to lead the European Union. But there is a grave error the EU can make with this. The reason why Poland and, and Polish people want to be part of the EU is that they have seen that historically as the best vehicle for maintaining their territorial sovereignty and national integrity. It's not that they're signing up to some pan-European identity, it's that they see themselves as an independent state and this mechanism being a useful way to maintain their national independence. Now, if you have a huge military, one that is vastly larger than any other European country, then they're going to feel pretty secure in the strength of their own national armed forces. And the uh, willingness of the Polish people to compromise, which is currently what polling is asking the Polish government to do, is the polling of the Polish people is to say, you know, we think this isn't the hill to die on. You should give up on this judicial body. Um, we think you should kind of just do what the EU says on this subject. Well, if they feel they have other options, if they feel they have the backing of the United States, if they have a large military domestic armed forces, they're going to be far less willing to support the EU over their own national government, particularly when that government is stepping up for values and ideas that uh, the Poles themselves strongly support, such as some of these key conservative social issues. Uh, and thus, this military expansion should be seen as a real threat to the EU, not in terms of direct military attack, but in terms of what it means for the independently minded Poles and how confident they will be 
in going against the European Union in future in disputes like this one. This dispute, while the EU may well win it because of the domestic support that they have in Poland, is a a wake-up call for the Polish government and it's a wake-up call for the Poles that in the future these disputes will emerge and the Polish government want greater flexibility of action to gain the support of their people to resist EU demands. And if uh, these things keep happening, then eventually... Uh, there'll be a a, a conflict that is irreconcilable on both sides and the Polish people will vote to leave the EU much like the British people did. So right now there is overwhelming support for the EU, but the EU would do well to remember the reason why that support exists and it's not because they share the same uh, worldview of pan-European superstate under EU auspices. Uh, they strongly believe in their national identity. The Poles want to have their national borders, much like Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia do as well. Uh, and their support for the EU isn't unconditional. It's, uh, it's premised on the fact that it is the best mechanism to support their national sovereignty. If they find alternative mechanisms, such as a strong military to do that, well, then the EU becomes superfluous. And those Uh, contests mean that their national politic won't give ground as easily. That's my view. That's sort of my analysis of the situation. I would love to hear your perspective on this. Do you support this massive military expansion? Is this something that the Poles can afford to do? Financially, it will be quite costly. Uh, If you're in Poland, do you support the national government in the kind of judicial fight? Uh, Do you kind of agree with my analysis here? Or do you think that the support within Poland for like the pan-European identity is stronger than what I've articulated? I'd love to hear your perspective. If you find value in these discussions, please like and subscribe. And most of all, share these videos. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Goodbye.